Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School, and today we'll be looking at our last sections of Chapter 21. We're going to start out by looking at, well, how do we detect radioactivity when it occurs? Well, one way in which you can do it is to use a device called a Geiger counter, which is something most of you have heard of. And really what it does is it measures the activity present in a radioactive uh, sample. In other words, how much is it disintegrating in a given amount of time? That's what the activity is a measure of. A uh, sample that is uh, larger is going to be decaying at a much faster rate and releasing more particles in a given amount of time. Now, how does it actually work? Well, ionizing radiation that's created here, the alpha and beta particles and so on, when they move through the surroundings, the air, they can actually ionize the particles. That's why it's ionizing radiation. So inside a Geiger counter, you have argon gas, and when alpha and beta particles penetrate the argon gas, they will create ions, and those ions conduct an electrical current. And that's really what it's attempting to detect when it's counting radiation is, okay, at this point I can uh, conduct electricity, that must have been a particle, and now it's gone. And then another second later, another particle comes through, I can conduct electricity. That's really what it's counting, is the presence of those ions that gets created in the argon gas inside there, and it literally attempts to conduct electricity, and when it can, it detects a particle. And it literally counts, that's why we call it a Geiger counter. So that's really what it's doing, is the ionizing radiation allows it for a brief instant to conduct electricity, and that trips the trigger and counts one. So that's how we can detect when ionizing radiation is coming off the sample and how much is coming off. Now, there is a tremendous amount of energy stored in a nuclei, and in 21.6, we're going to start to look at that energy in a variety of different situations. Now, this is the first time we're actually going to get to use an equation you've all heard of many times before, but never really applied, and that's Einstein's equation of E equals mc squared. This is the relationship between the energy and matter. So when we destroy matter in nuclear reactions, unlike chemical and physical reactions, we're actually destroying matter, that's going to create a tremendous amount of energy, and we can calculate energy through this equation. Now, in typical chemical reactions, where law of conservation of mass says, you know, we're not destroying matter and our mass is constant, the actual amount of mass changes that are ever happening on any level would be very, very, very minimal. So we're looking at literally the heat changes, the enthalpy change of the reaction. However, when we have a nuclear reaction, um, because there is a measurable change in mass, we have tremendous amounts of energy compared to your typical chemical reaction. So the energy per mole of a nuclear reaction, significantly higher than the energy per mole of a ordinary chemical reaction. And here's an example of that. We've got a radioactive decay of uranium-238, and in the course of decaying, we can measure the mass change over time. So one mole of it decayed, and we lost 0 0.004 grams of mass. Now, we're calculating energy. Our unit of energy is the joule. And remember, that locks us into kilograms and meters and seconds. So the first thing I notice when I look at this problem is I'm in grams. i got to be in kilograms. So when I go to set up my equation for the change in energy, the change in energy in this case would be the change in mass times the speed of light squared, I have to convert to kilograms first. I've got to fix the units. Then I can actually calculate my energy in joules. And notice, 4.1 times 10 to the 11th negative is meaning it's axothermic. It's releasing that much energy when that amount of mass goes down. It's a huge amount of energy compared to normal energies of reactions for ordinary chemical and physical reactions. Their energy per mole significantly, significantly lower than this is. So there's a ton of energy to be harnessed in nuclear reactions. Now in the 1930s, chemists discovered that the masses of nuclei are always less than the masses of the individual nucleons. So when we actually add up how many protons and neutrons they are, and we know the masses of the protons and neutrons, scientists couldn't figure out why the total mass of the nucleus wasn't larger. When we actually add up the masses of the nucleons present, we get a bigger number than the nucleus ever weighs. And that was what was known as the mass defect or the mass deficit. Where was this mysterious mass going? Well, it makes sense if you think about it. Nucleuses are made up of a bunch of protons and neutrons. Well, protons are all positively charged and they're crammed together in a very tight space. So there must be a tremendous amount of energy being used to hold those nucleuses together. Well, that's the strong nuclear force we talked about earlier in this chapter. Well, where does that energy come from? Well, the missing mass here. So some of the mass of our nucleons 
have been destroyed and converted to energy to help hold that nucleus together. And that's really what the mass defect is all about. Now, how can we calculate what that nuclear force is? So how much energy does it actually take to hold together this nucleus inside a helium atom? Well, we know helium has helium-4, that is, has two protons and two neutrons. We can add up the actual masses, and I've listed in your notes what the masses of these particles would be. When we add them up, you get 4.03188 atomic mass units. Well, the actual mass of helium-4 is only 4.00150. We're short, basically, 0 0.03038 atomic mass units. Well, that is the mass that gets converted to energy to hold our nucleus together, and it's known as nuclear binding energy. It's related to that strong nuclear force. So this is the mass lost to the surroundings as energy. And we can take that mass, plug it into equals mc squared, and actually calculate what the energy would be. So it's basically the mass loss of the surroundings as energy when the nucleons were bound together in the first place, lowering potential energy and making a stable nucleus. Remember, lower potential energy, more stable. So the larger the binding energy, the more stable the nucleus is. Now, binding energies, if you look at the graph here on the right, increase, and then they peak around a mass of somewhere between 50 and 60, around iron, and then they slowly decrease after that. Well, one of the things that I just mentioned about lower potential energy, more stable, that seems to kind of go against that general idea. You know, here we've got higher potential energy, and we're talking about more stable. So what's going on? Well, notice what this says. It says binding energy per nucleon over there. Now, if we actually graph that as potential energy, not the binding energy per nucleon, but the actual potential energy, we can see that it does match what we'd talked about. So now we're graphing it as bond or bond potential energy per nucleon. And now you'll notice it's getting lower in potential energy until we hit iron. And then after that, it slowly increases. So here on our potential energy diagram, you can see what we're talking about. Up top, we were talking about the binding energy per nucleon, not the potential energy per nucleon. So when we switch our graph a little bit, you can see that now what we're looking at makes more sense. So afterwards, you know, we got more stable at iron. Why after that is it increasing? Why does it just keep getting more stable? Well, the reason is we've got more proton to proton repulsion. We're cramming more protons in a very small space, and that starts to raise our potential energy as we become less stable. And eventually, we end up with something so large, it's just not going to be stable anymore. Now, next section gets into harnessing some of this nuclear energy. Nuclear power is what they're talking about in the form of fission in section 21.7. So how do we tap that energy? Well, one way is with fission. We break a large amount of atoms to release the energy bound in those nucleuses. Now, nuclear fission is a type of reaction carried out in nuclear reactors. So what's happening at Byron Nuclear Power Plant to generate electricity? Well, they're fissioning uranium-235 with a neutron. So a neutron comes in, collides with uranium-235, and then these two reactions occur. So there's actually two different kinds of nuclear reactions that occur in a nuclear power plant. Well, when these reactions occur, they release tremendous amounts of energy. And that's really what we're harnessing at the nuclear power plant is that large amount of energy that's coming off. So in a nuclear power plant, by heating up water, it's basically a big steam uh, engine, we end up harnessing the energy that comes out of these nuclear reactions to create electricity by basically turning water into steam and pushing turbines with it. So fission is one way that we can harness some of this nuclear energy and nuclear reactions to do useful work and eventually make electricity. Now what's really happening, and the, the secret to what's really going on in nuclear fission is the fact that one neutron came in so if you go back to our previous side and look at the situation, one neutron was coming in, but notice more neutrons came out. And that's really the secret to what's happening in nuclear fission and why it's sustainable is because when one comes in, it creates more neutrons, which can hit more nucleuses, which then can create more reactions. And we have, through the bombardment of the radioactive nuclide, uh, with a neutron, we can start a chain reaction where one neutron can create more neutrons, which can create more neutrons as more nuclides get hit and release more energy. So we end up with a chain reaction. And that's kind of the key to this is we can start the reaction and then it keeps going and keeps releasing energy. 
but the amount of energy and the amount of neutrons are increasing. So we've got to be careful with this type of reaction. If it gets too much energy too quickly, then we've got a dangerous situation. Now, neutrons are released in the transmutation. They strike other nuclei, causing their decay, and this keeps the process going and creating more neutrons, which is the benefit to this reaction is we can get a sustainable chain reaction going. And we can use that to harness energy in the form of basically heated up water to turn a turbine and make electricity. So this process continues in what we call a nuclear chain reaction. And that's the key to fission is we can set up this chain reaction, push over one domino and the other dominoes keep falling for us. Now, if there's not enough radioactive nuclides nearby, neutrons start to miss and the chain reaction slows down or dies out. So it's really critical that we have enough fissionable material close enough together so when one neutron hits a nucleus and it releases more neutrons, they will in turn hit nucleuses. So we need a really a certain minimum amount of fissionable material to get this chain reaction going. And that's what's known as critical mass. So there must be a certain minimum number or amounts of or density of this fissional material so that the neutrons don't miss. And that's what we call a critical mass. If you have below a critical mass, you don't get a sustainable chain reaction occurring. Now, if we have too much material, then we get an out of control expanding chain reaction, a supercritical mass, and then we can have basically a nuclear bomb. In a nuclear power plant, you just don't have enough fissionable material. It has to be at critical mass. But critical mass and releasing a lot of energy is not the same as releasing massive quantities of energy because neutrons will miss in a critical mass. It's just enough to get a sustainable chain reaction going. So a nuclear power plant really can't become a nuclear bomb. That doesn't mean it isn't potentially dangerous, but it's not going to end up exploding like, like a nuclear bomb would. So in a nuclear reactor, what you're really doing is you're taking that energy that comes in that expanding chain reaction and you're using it to make steam. And then we use that steam to push a turbine. And from there, we've got electricity being generated. And then we just need to cool the steam back off, push it through again, and keep the process going. So inside our nuclear reactor, we have our fissionable material inside the core. And around that, we're going to have water that we're going to heat up. And then next to that is going to be water that we are going to basically make steam out of. And so the, the water that we're actually talking about making the steam from is removed. It's not the same water that's in the core. So notice there, there are multiple loops here. But eventually, all we're really doing is taking the energy from the nuclear reaction and using it to heat up water and push a turbine. Now, inside our reactor core, we have control rods and fuel rods. Now, the fuel rods are our fissionable material at critical mass. And what the control rods do is they steal neutrons. So if we want to slow down the reaction and slow down the chain a little bit, we just need more neutrons to not hit nucleuses and keep the reaction going. So if you drop the coal control rods down between the fuel rods, they start to steal neutrons and drop them deep enough and you can steal enough neutrons to shut down the reaction. So your reaction is kept in check really by the use of control rods. And all they're really doing is blocking the path of neutrons to keep the reaction from getting out of control. Not to say there can't be serious consequences, but it's not a super critical mass like in a nuclear bomb. And that's really how they slow down and control the reactions. Now the next section is 21.8 nuclear power fusion. Now fusion, unlike fission, doesn't have some of the drawbacks in terms of some of the radioactive particles that come off and how long they take to become um, more stable, not as dangerous nucleuses. That's a big problem with fission is the waste material it sits around for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years being dangerous. So we have to handle and you, uh, find a way to basically store all that material as it gets created. Well, fusion is actually a much cleaner process. In some ways, you can say that um, all life on Earth gets its energy from fusion reactions. And at the same token, you could say, well, no energy on Earth really comes from fusion that we harness uh, because it's not like fission where we can make a nuclear power plant out of it. So how come we can say all energy comes from fusion? Well, because the sun is a nuclear fusion power plant and all the chemical energy on Earth really originated from the sun. So fusion is the energy that gets released when light nuclei are, are fused together, fusing to make heavier ones. And it's a much cleaner form of energy. The sun produces most of its energy through fusion. So the light that comes to Earth that gets harnessed in chemical uh, by plants and then distributed throughout the ecosystem as 
animals eat plants and animals eat other animals and so on, really originated from the sun. So in most respects, we could say pretty much all the potential energy on Earth originated with the sun, which is a fusion reaction. Now, as far as nuclear power from fusion, that's kind of a problem because fusion would be a much more superior way of generating power because of its lack of radioactive byproducts that are terrible to deal with for long term. Uh, the problem is that in order to achieve fusion, material must be in the plasma state, which is at several million kelvins. So one of the secrets to fission is that chain reaction idea, how easy it is with enough material close enough together to get a critical mass. So you get that continually going chain reaction. Well, with fusion, to get that continuous process going, we have to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly hot. So that brings up two problems. How do we get something that hot to make the reaction go? And then how do we store it? How do we actually build a container that can contain something that hot? Well, at this point, we don't really have a great answer to that. So there are some proposed mechanisms and so forth. But at this point, there are no fusion nuclear power plants out there. Now, a tokamak, like is listed at the right, is kind of a an example of a method we can use generating magnetic fields to make magnetic bottles to try and hold this incredibly, incredibly hot plasma. Uh, but at this point, we don't really have any working tokamak reactors. So while all energy on Earth comes from fusion, we can also say no energy on Earth, so to speak, comes from fusion. And that ends our last set of notes from the chapter.